What's going on, everybody? Hope you are having a wonderful week so far. Uh, before we start the podcast, I would love it if you hit subscribe. Um, it just keeps the podcast going. So whatever you can do, and if you like an episode, please share it with your friends. And I just, I just want to get more people on this podcast. Um, but yeah, thank you to all of you that listen every week. It means a lot, and I, it's the reason why I keep doing it. So thank you for that. So uh, podcast time this week, Eric Fuller. Eric has been a promoter in the industry for a long time, over 50, over 20, 15 years, I believe. I'm trying to do maths in my head right now, and my maths is terrible, so I apologize for that, Eric. Um, started in 2008 to now um and he, we've done a few parties together over the years we've most recently done a party uh, music miami week which was the reason why i wanted to get him on the podcast eric threw 22 parties in i think five days over the miami music week conference which was insane to me um, so I wanted to get him on to talk about that, but I just wanted to get him on and also talk about what it's like being a promoter. I've only had a couple of promoters on the podcast, but I feel like Eric is the, the only like just strictly promoter I've had on the podcast. Um, so I thought it'd be really good for you all to listen to a p promoter's perspective on the industry and how to how to become a promoter and how to kind of move forward with that. So without further ado, Eric Fuller. Eric Fuller, what's cooking, man? What's happening, Will? How you doing? Doing well, doing well. How are you today? I'm good, man. I'm um, three, this is my third podcast today. Um, so I'm conversationed it to the max right now. Um, but I'm, I feel like I'm in a role, so I'm happy with it. How are you? What's going on? uh not much man just uh hanging out here in miami i'm actually yeah. in the middle of moving so i'm in my i'm in my current office right now um and i'm i'm in the process of moving to a new spot in winwood so nice. that's what's going on fun nice, times man. moving how's miami how's all the flooding <laughs> uh it's good i mean miami's uh we have like a limestone uh, ground or whatever yeah. you call it, soil. So the water drains pretty quick. But yeah, yeah. there was a little bit of a uh, little bit of flooding from that last storm, but it wasn't wasn't too bad. That's cool. I'm actually in Miami tomorrow. Um, oh, not, nice. Not when this podcast comes out, but yeah, I, I'll be there tomorrow. I'm playing space. Um, oh, cool. So it should be good. Should be good, man. Nice. Did you man, did, did you did you grow up in Miami? I did not. Um, I actually grew up in in Central Florida in Orlando. Okay. Um, so no, but I've lived here for around ten years now. Yeah. What made you go? What made you go to Miami? Um. So uh, it was really work. Um, I was a part of the the brand, the event, Life and Color. Mm -hmm. We had that had kind of formed in college. Yeah. Um, so I went to school in Jacksonville at the university of North Florida. And then I actually moved to Europe. I was living in Spain and, um, simultaneously, I was like flying home to do these events, mm. day glow life and color. And yeah, just the, the company, like we had always envisioned living in, in Miami. It was yeah. like, you know, Miami is the, the place to be at. So, mm. and obviously for, for dance music and, and for events, it's a great place to be. So it just kind of, kind of gravitated towards, towards the city. What made you go to Spain? Um, man, I, I don't know the exact answer It's just, uh, something in my heart told me to go. I wanted to go. I studied abroad there when I was oh, cool. actual, an actual student. Um, I was really into, got really into electronic music. Um, it's funny. I was listening to Chris, your, your podcast with Chris Lake, his, uh, his music was a huge reason why I mm. fell in love with, with dance music. Um, his early days. So like changes. Yeah. Days. Yeah. Changes was wow. like, that was the track. When I heard changes, I was actually at a, at a club and I heard the song and I like went to the booth and with my like broken Spanish, like, what what song was that? You know, <laughs> what year was uh, that? 2008? 
Yeah, I was there in 2000. When was that? I got Google when it I was there out. twice, but the second time I was there, I graduated in 2008, 2009. And I went straight straight away. So yeah, it was around 2008, 2009. Yeah, when did that track come out? Um, yeah, 2008. Fuck. Yeah. It's a long time ago now. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I just, dude, I was, I was coming, I had a, I just got a degree in finance. Mm. Um, obviously the, the world economy was in, in just good. Yeah. And I was doing really well with my events. Like I was making really good money. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I, I was living in, in Spain. I was actually DJing. So yeah. I was making pretty decent income. Oh, cool. Um, I had my events business and yeah, I just wanted to live there. And it was like, Oh, I'm not going to put on a suit. I realized I don't want to put on a suit and go work for Merrill Lynch or one of these yeah, big yeah, companies. Yeah. And so I just, yeah, I just went with it. Sorry. My camera just fucking overheated again. So I'm on the, the normal camera now. Um, that's all good. <laughs> I guess 2008 was an interesting time to <clears throat> try and get into business generally, right? You know, for a lot of people, I think probably, yeah, but we were just young kids mm. right out of college. We didn't know any different. Mm. You know, I didn't know what the hell was going on. Like, I knew what was going on with the markets and yeah. in the world, obviously everybody did, but mm. it didn't, it didn't affect my mental state. It was like, I was throwing parties. We were making money Yeah, that all that was, I was able to, to like pay my bills and eat. So I was, I was cool, you know? So was that like realistically the first bit of income you started, you had was throwing parties? Yeah. Throwing parties and DJing, you know, I was throwing parties and the DJs in my city that we were booking, there was one guy that was really good, which I met later down the road. And he actually taught me a lot about, mm. about how to properly DJ and mix. Yeah. Um, but I was paying these guys like 50, 150 bucks and they were terrible. Yeah. And I would go to like cities like Miami and, and Orlando and hear better DJs. I'm yeah. like, I'm just going to do this on my own. I'm just going to figure it out. So I bought all the equipment train wreck, like the first <laughs> probably 20 parties and, uh, and just fell in love. I fell in love with, mm. with mixing and DJing. And I, I, I bought all the equipment to, to actually produce, Yeah, but I was, my parties were doing well. So I just like, all right, I'm going to stick to that and not bother mm. with the, with the, with the music. It's really interesting uh, because sorry to buy in, but everybody really. I speak to you're, you're literally the first official promoter I've had on the podcast. Really? Um, I, I had Lucas from Lucas, Agul from space. Um, but you're like the first official promoter that I've had. And oh, you had Lu you had Lucas on? Yeah, yeah, I had Lucas on like back in the oh, day. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, he's a great guy. He's the best, man. I love Lucas. Um, but you're like the f obviously Lucas is a promoter, but he also does a lot of other things in the space bracket. If you know what I mean. Um, oh yeah, I mean, I, I was I was actually an owner of Club Space up until about maybe eight months ago oh really i didn't i knew you had part but i didn't know it was that soon yeah yeah so i i, I know lucas very well mm. he's he's a great guy lucas is the best great man. promoter yeah yeah but going from what you're saying to usually what it is is djs start promoting they start djing they start promoting and then they're like fuck promoting it's the hardest thing ever and then get the fuck out of promoting and start djing again or start producing music or just concentrate on being an artist well it's yeah. interesting where you went i don't need to dj i'm just gonna throw the parties yeah <laughs> it's um i mean I, I kept djing for years up until i would say maybe 2012 you know, I'd always have like a thumb drive on me. Yeah. So like there's several times at Life in Color where an artist missed their flight mm. or the opener didn't show up and I'd go up and play. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, 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 so I stuck with it for a bit, but obviously like I just love throwing events. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I, I kind of knew I've always been a person like when I'm passionate about something, um, I get hyper focused on it. Mm. And if I'm not, then I just, you know, I don't pay attention to it. So I just, I realized at that point what it took to be a, a producer. Yeah. And because and, and in reality, like I think earlier on, you could be a successful uh, DJ without producing mm. um, maybe 
maybe for there was like a, a period of time when that could actually happen. Uh, but I, re- I realized early on is like, you really need to be making incredible music. Yeah. Um, and the commitment and the time that it would, that it would take for me to do that. It just wasn't like, it wasn't in my heart. Yeah, so I yeah. just backed off. But it's really interesting that you say that because I felt the same about promoting for me as a, as a promoter, like I pr- promoted, if I promoted over the years and very quickly realized, oh my God, this is a level of work that I'm not willing to put in because it needs a specific amount of work to do certain things. And that's just not for me. So it's very interesting how you decided to do that. And I decided to do that. And so many people (laughs) are like that. I take my, I, I talk a lot of shit on promoters, but I also have so much respect for promoters as well because it's, it keeps us going really yeah. it's, it's a part of the there's there's parts of this industry that we all need each other and promoting and djing especially in art like or promoting an artist right we all need each other have this like yeah. love-hate relationship where we're always battling against each other but we also always want the best for each other because then we all win and we all want to throw at the end of the day we want to throw a fucking amazing party um, yeah 100 percent. when was it for you where you were like I'm <clears throat> sorry. I'm going to go this like full time and I'm just going to go for it. Uh, it was actually a phone call I had with my grandfather. He's like, he's a really important person to me. Um, I speak to him all the time and it, you know, we were chatting and I said, you know, pop, I call him pop up. Mm-hmm. I said, pop up, you know, I have this job offer from Red Bull. I have this job offer from Merrill Lynch, mm-hmm. but I really like throwing these events and he was like, listen, you need to follow your, your heart and your intuition. And you've always, you've always like done well. Um, you've always kind of done well, off, you know, on your own, like mm. exploring uh, different things and doing different things. So you should go for that. So that I was like, the when he said that to me, it was just like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm all in on this. Mm. And, and I, and I, and I went all in on it. So that was the moment that I, I, I knew that, you know, I was going to put all my energy into, uh, into the events business. Yeah. I love that. What year was that? I was 2000, 2009, I think. Yeah. 2008, 2009. Yeah. So when I was in, right when I was graduating college, mm. it was basically when, when that conversation happened. And when did Life in Color start from then? So Life in Color actually started in, in, but prior to that, it was what, 2005, 2006. It used to be called Dayglow. Okay. Um, And then there was a trademark issue, so we had to change the name. Um, But yeah, it started in, I think, 2005, 2006. And what was the the kind of journey between that and to now? Um. Man, it was an incredible journey. Um, there's a, a group of guys that I had got to know in college, and they were also throwing uh, paint parties called yeah. Dayglow. So eventually joined up with them, um, moved to, to South Florida. Yeah. We actually started in Boca. Um, and at the time, we were just kind of breaking out of Florida, like mm-hmm. in Ohio, uh, San Diego. Um, so, yeah, that thing just just kind of took off really in a natural way. Um, and I was with life and color. Obviously we got, we had got acquired from, from SFX. Yeah. So we sold the company, went to work for SFX, yeah. did that. Then I was part of the whole regroup with lifestyle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is how I got to know like MJ. I listened to his, mm. your, your podcast with him, which was, which is great. He's another great person I got to know yeah. over the years. Um, so yeah, I went from, from, from the SFX to the lifestyle. Um, around that time I had joined the, the partnership with David and Coloma and mm-hmm. Davide at space. Um, and then that's led me to where I am today, which yeah. I've, I've, I've exited that partnership. I'm no longer involved in obviously a lifestyle and I'm just doing my own thing now, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, it all, it all started with, with, with the paint party, man. Yeah. <laughs> it really did. How was it like 
did, was was the paint party your idea or or did you go into that kind of going in and helping them how how did that all start so i actually i i was doing the paint parties so there's a group in tallahassee it was a fraternity they were throwing like the party privately so mm-hmm. they were having like a fraternity party and they yeah. invited a bunch of chicks and my roommate <laughs> was he somehow went to the went to that party and yeah. he came came back and he's like, oh, man, you got to do this party. It's the coolest party ever. Yeah. And he wouldn't shut up about it. So I was like, all right, dude, like we'll do it. Yeah. So I got in touch with the kids from the fraternity. I paid them like 200 bucks. They came over. They showed me how to set up the venue, mm-hmm. what to do with the paint. And we threw our first party. I, I literally used my student loan to fund, fund the event. And I made like 1200 bucks or a thousand bucks. And I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> you know, like. We, it really was like a great party. So we did it again and it, yeah, it just kept getting bigger, but, um, that's how I got involved. Mm. And then there was, a, I, I mentioned there was a, um, a group of guys that later on they started doing the party as well, but they started actually touring it. Okay. So they were doing it in like Orlando. Um, I think they did one in Tallahassee and, I, and they did one in South Florida. Mm. So I got to know them. Um, and we just started like develop the relationship. It's actually Paul Campbell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, a guy, Sebastian Solano, Lucas, uh, Lucas and his twin brother, Patrick. Mm-hmm. So I got to know those guys and it was just like a really natural, um, kind of relationship and yeah. fit. So yeah, I, I basically, you know, came back from Spain and went all in with, with the company and yeah, here I am today. That's pretty amazing, man. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, when you go from being like an independent promoter running a party like like that and then it gets bought out by SFX, how does that change your kind of view on the industry and how it all works? It's a good question. Um, I, I don't think it really changed. I think it made us for me, it made me take things more seriously, yeah. which I, I was always taking it very seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it made me elevate my game personally. Like yeah. I started learning more about like corporate budgeting, mm-hmm. uh, legal, um, structural stuff that things that you would never really think of like, yeah. Hey, do we have the right insurances? Cause those are things that can put you out of business. Yeah. Right. Uh, and when you're, when you're dealing with, you know, millions of dollars, you need to, you need to think about those type mm. of things. So, um, I definitely learned, learned a lot about corporate politics and how all of that can work or not work. Mm. Um, not that it was a, a good or bad experience. It just, you know, I, before it was just our group of friends running yeah. the company, having yeah, yeah. the best time ever. And then you insert like this corporate you know, a monster. And it's like, yeah, you got to report your financials and you have to follow a budget Mm. and, you know, Hey, we want to spend money on a new paint system or a new marketing plan. Mm. Like we would just do it. But then we'd have to go through the proper channels. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's my experience anyway. So mostly positive. Yeah. I think mostly positive. I, I think the dance music, um, dance music in general, like the business of it is, is, has consolidated over the years. It's mm. become more of a, of a business, like more, more corporate, if you will. And that's just natural. Um, I think I, I realized that a few years ago, it's like, there's this new, obviously the, the business of, of live events has been there for, for a while now. Yeah. There's already a, we look at like the touring rock world. That's, that's been there for a bit. It's solid. Yeah. It's got its people. And mm. so this is all new, uh, for dance music, at least the last 10 years, yeah. but it, it's, it's obviously consolidated and, and capital has a lot to do with that. Like people are looking to create efficiencies and go bigger and make more money. And mm. it all plays into that. So, yeah. Where as a promoter though, where does that, where does the corporate side of things ever get in the way of the creating or do you think it helps? I think it can. I think that comes down to like the relationship, like who you're, you know, if you're looking to sell your company, um, 
you know, you should do your diligence of like who you're, who you're going to be partners with. Yeah. Um, because you know, the reality is the, the alignment may or may not be there, mm. but I think it can be a, a great thing. I think it can, um, you know, give you the, the funding, right. And the resources so that you can focus on the creative yeah. aspect of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if the partnership set up right and the intentions are done right from the beginning, I think it can be a great thing. Mm. I love that. I love that. Um, going from life in color to where you are today. Um, and when did blank canvas start? So we, we started blank canvas, um, actually under, um, the lifestyle umbrella. Okay. So I had around the time we were transitioning from SFX to lifestyle. I was actually like going to leave. Yeah. Um, I had bought into club space mm -hmm. into that, into that group. Um, and I was planning on starting blank canvas, mm. um, just on my own. And I yeah. would do parties at the club and then I would do my own events. Um, but I had a meeting with, with, with Randy Phillips. Um, and it was a really good meeting. And he said, look, we want to, he was the, the, the CEO of lifestyle. Um, and, and he was like, look, we want to support all these things that, you know, you want to do. Mm. Um, and blank canvas was one of them. So it started under that, um, obviously lifestyle didn't work out as an entity, you know, generally as a whole entity. Yeah. Um, so I, I purchased that back from, from the company in what was it? 2019 or 2000. Yeah. yeah. yeah 2019. So I think it started in 2017 and, uh, yeah. And then I, I bought it back in 2019. It's still here today. Still here. And <clears throat> when you, what was the goal with blank canvas when you first started? Really? I, I wanted to, cause at the time we were running life in color. Right. So it was that let's call it the non pain events. Yeah. And we just had a lot of great, like, especially here in South Florida, we had a lot of great just resources and infrastructure and data. And we knew, we obviously know how to throw events. Yeah. So my plan was just to do non pain events. And as I've gotten older, it's like, look, I would like to, to do things that are a little more my taste and yeah. my style. So that's, that was the intention of it. Um, I didn't, I didn't have like an, a specific plan other than to just, that would be the forward facing entity mm. to the public to, to promote and produce events. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. When I guess that's a, that's an interesting question when you're, how much of what you do is for your taste and how much of what you do is to make money? Um, I think it's a mix. It's a mix. I'm really more, I've always loved house music. Yeah. Um, you know, I mentioned like Chris Lake was yeah. one of my favorite artists. So I've, I've always loved, uh, more the house progressive house, Let's just call it house music. Mm. Um, so, you know, we get to do a lot of that during, like in June deep, that's one of my favorite. Yeah. I listen to that stuff all day long. I literally so like just I did a conversation, did a podcast with Jody Wistanoff, literally like before, before. You oh, did. wow. Yeah. Yeah. So we we're talking a lot about and Gina. Yeah. So like that stuff, you know, I, I'm listening to that when I'm working all day and, and hanging out. So yeah, I get, I get to do, I get to do a lot of that. Um, and then there's some other stuff that I don't, it's not that I don't like it, but like, I'm not a huge, like we do a lot of bass music stuff, right? Yeah. I don't listen to a ton of bass music mm. when I'm at work, right? Or, or when I'm in my car, it's yeah. just not my taste, but I have a couple guys that I work with that like, they're super into the bass yeah, yeah, yeah. scene. So they're like the ear to that, to that sound. Mm. And obviously producing an event doesn't matter what the genre is in terms of like, mm what porter potties do we need and fencing and totally. generators yeah, and yeah. stuff like that and pulling permits like that doesn't matter no so well i think yeah. that's the so thing is like is there's there has to be something in it that you enjoy and if it's not necessarily the genre of music that you don't love but you love make putting events on and and doing that then that's that's your kind of creative side of 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 what you do um yeah how many events are you throwing every year? 
Um, well, music music week we did twenty two events in a week. Yeah, that was mental. It was mental. That was yeah, it was. It was uh, that was really one of the most difficult weeks of my life, to be quite honest. Mm. Um, there's I had a lot of other personal things going on at mm. the time that just you know that's how life works. Yeah. So that made it equal. That made it a, a quite a bit more complicated. Mm. Um. But I'd say we do probably 50 to 60 events a year. Mm. Um, you know, we're, we're like right now, we're especially coming out of COVID. We're just trying to be smart about what we do and when we do it and make sure that it's, you know, the right quality and the yeah. right artists that we want to work with. Mm. So we're, we're not doing like, we could do a lot more, um, but there's also other, you know, like I'm developing a venue right now. Amazing. So I have other things that are taking my time. Yeah. So it's like, let's do the stuff that makes sense financially that we're passionate about mm. people that we want to work with. And then the rest will follow in time, you know? Yeah, yeah. How does it work? I want to talk about that with personal. I want to talk about music week as well, because it's one of the reasons why, yeah. I, why I wanted to get you on was because of music week. And I knew how many shows like we did a party together, but I knew how many shows you guys put on during music week. But I want to talk about personal life a little bit if you're willing to go into it and sure and how being uh, you're always on as a promoter there's there's for me from what I see from an outside point of view and not really fully being a promoter but you guys are always on yeah whether it's an, a tonight show or tomorrow's show or a show in a week's time or a show in a month's time or planning six months in advance or every agent hitting you up going we need a show for this person we need a show for this artist blah 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 this show's not selling what do we do etc cetera, etc cetera. i couldn't even like i i have to deal with my own shows let alone 10 other shows of other artists like i couldn't even imagine what you guys how do you balance that personal life and when shit's going on in your personal life because we all have shit that goes on in our personal life how do you balance that and still run a successful business i think I, I, one thing i've learned to do over time is to like really actually make time for things so mm -hmm. in my calendar you know like for example friday mornings from 8 a.m to noon i don't do anything like i go to the beach yeah I take a swim, I work out, hit the sauna. Mm. And that's like a huge reset for me. If I can get that in, my life's already better for the week. Yeah. And then that allows me to kind of like unwind going into the weekend where I spend time with my daughter and my, my wife. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I've learned to do is to just make time for the, like, I have to do it. Like during this one hour, mm. I've, I've just, blocked off to just look at creative shit online or read a book or yeah. So that's, that's what I've learned to do. Do you, it, it helps. Do you find delegation helps? Do you have a good team around you employing good, good team? Or do you find, is it, do you do a lot of like yourself as well? Just where you kind of have to run everything yourself. Um, I have a good team. Yeah. We work with a lot of contractors, mm. right? So a lot of different vendors that I've worked with over the years that I trust mm. Um, so yeah, you definitely have, especially during a week, like music week, you have to delegate yeah, and you have to trust people, um, outside of music week, I'm definitely way more, more hands-on with the event because, you know, we're, we're a small team. Like yeah. there's, there's three of us, yeah. right. That's it. Yeah. And then everything else we, we contract out. Mm -hmm. so. What What would be those things that you contract out? Uh, it depends on the on the event, but like I'll hire a production manager, mm. somebody, you know, that's well-versed in building structures and mm. taking them down. Um, we'll hire like a site operations manager, an artist relations team. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like ticket security, things yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. So in your team, what, what are the, all the roles in your team? Um, it's really talent buying, um, and, and marketing. Those are the two, the two things. So I do all the buying myself. And then I have, uh, another guy on my team, Cameron, 
he's more into like the bass music scene. Yeah. Um, he actually manages some artists too. Uh, so he's, we handle most of the buying and having another guy that just focuses on, on the marketing side of things. And then through that, we have a system of, you know, go to vendors and contractors that we, we work with, you know, almost on a monthly basis. Mm. Yeah. Cause if you're doing 50, 60 shows a, a year, that's pretty much one a week, right? Yeah. Yeah. We go through periods of like, down to times like summer's a little slow for us mm. at least we do we do we're a little more active in nashville in the summer um and then here it's obviously like in miami it's it's the winter and fall time is when yeah. we can do stuff because of the weather just because it's so fucking hot in the in the summer yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that makes sense so do you i didn't know you did shows all around florida yeah we Right now, it's really just um, Fort Lauderdale and Miami. Mm. We used to do some stuff. Like, we actually, in 2019, we did a show with you, Paul, mm-hmm. at uh, in St. Pete. And then we did I one in Orlando show. together. I love that show. With the one in St. Pete? Yeah. What yeah. was that club? It's called Morph. It's closed down because I know Steph that ran it pretty yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's closed down now, right? Yeah. We were actually trying to buy that building. We had it under contract, uh, but COVID hit. So I mm-hmm. dropped it. Um, yeah. I wish I wouldn't have, cause I mean, uh, like all the, all of it's exploded in terms of like real estate value, but just man, that, vi- that, that building just spoke to me. I was like, this is such a cool spot. It was so cool. And as a club, like it was so spit and sawdust. Like it was just so rough around the edges, but so well put together and just, you know, when <clears throat> it's kind of like when you're first starting out your career where you just like get your mates to kind of help you and put everything together and nothing's perfect, but it just feels so right. That, yeah. was, that was what that venue and being touring in America, you don't really get that that often because America is a lot more corporate than the rest yeah. of the rest of the world. And I find that most venues are like run very like not necessarily very well, but like it's very professional and it's very done to the line where that was kind of a bit raw. And I I just, there's something about that venue I really liked. It's good fun. Yeah. It it was a good small room. I mean, it was what 500 capacity around 500 people. Yeah. Yeah, And it had the really high ceiling. So it felt like a, it's like a small venue, but Big. But felt yeah yeah if, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. I, f- I feel like there's a kind of a lack of five hundred to seven hundred cap venues generally in a, in the world. Like it, even yeah. in Bristol in the UK, like there's a lack of them, massive lack. Yeah. Of them. Because it, why is that as a promoter? What what do you think the reason behind that is? I, that's a good question. I think maybe it has something to do with what we talked about earlier, just the consolidation. I mean, if you're a, if you're, if you look at like who owns most of the venues, right. There's a handful of bigger companies, like they're looking to make money. So why would they bother with a 500 cap venue when they can own a 2,500 cap, Mm. you know? So I think that might have something to do with it. I don't know. I mean, there used to be, we used to have a network of, those size venues all over the state of Florida. Mm. There's not many, if, if any at all anymore, no. um, which I, I think is not good for the ecosystem. Right. I agree. Cause you need, you need these artists, like they need to showcase their, their talent and play and they got to mm. work their way through the system. Mm. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know, but that would be my guess. Maybe just the, the economics of it. Yeah. Because the thing is, is like, it's weird because I still think a 500, 700 cap venue can make a good amount of money. Yeah, it can. It can. I mean, when we had, you know, when I was involved at space, we had the ground Yeah, and that was something like early on we had, you know, I remember like walking the space with David, like I was really excited about that space in particular mm, because yeah. I knew I could do smaller base shows. And uh, I mean, we did a lot there and yeah. it was, it was a, you know, five, 600 cap room. Yeah. So it's a great room as um, well. 
Yeah, it is. It is. It's a great room. It is. There we go. There goes the no- notification. Notifications everywhere. I, I shut it off, dude. <laughs> like it's on, and it, let me let me just shut it off. It always happens. It's like it's so weird. Apple, get it together, man. Yeah, you put it on Do Not Disturb, and people can still call you, and you're like, "Fuck's sake, Apple, just Jesus." Well, that was my wife, so that might have been why. You just can take it if you want to take it, man. You, you're more than welcome to no, take no, it. No, 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 no. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. <clears throat> yeah, because I, I think. Smaller venues is a way to create new scenes and new movements. Um, I feel like when you're purely running shows in big venues, you rely so much on ticket sellers, on big ticket sellers. And I feel like, I I don't know, this is only my opinion and I'm happy to be wrong, but it would be interesting to get your opinion on it is it feels like there's actual less promoting on a bigger show where it's like Chris Lake or something like that, where the tickets sell very well, but it's more so the, the it's more on actually booking the shows and getting the right artists rather than curating an event where you're introducing new artists to a, a scene of people. How do you find like the, the, the difference between them? I think that's a really valid point. Um, yeah, because at that point you're, you're really doing, you know, like we'll use Chris Lake as an example. Like I know I could grab a 2000 cap venue and he would sell the tickets probably more. Yeah. Um, and at that point you're just facilitating his, his art, his creativity, you're ordering the generators, making sure the line works security, the bars are in order. I mean, you, 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 that's what you're, you're basically doing at that point, but yeah, the smaller rooms, you know, I, I just refer to them as like softer, softer mm. tickets. Yeah. It's more about the community. Yeah. The people that are there, um, you know, let's call them like influencers in a way where yeah. they have a social circle of friends that they can influence to come like, Hey, come check out this artist, mm. you know, and it's maybe it's cheaper to get in and or there's no cover at all. And you can be exposed to these, these types of, you know, artists and up and coming sound. But yeah, I would agree with that. How important is it to you though, to build a community as a promoter? Like if, if there was uh, somebody listening to this, like now, like who would, that was wanting to get into, into promoting, like how important is that community building period? It's important, especially early on. Um, Like I referencing when I started out in college, that's like I was I was doing when I was doing events in school like I was in Jacksonville Florida which mm. is a bit of like a it's, it's a southern state right yeah. I would mention you know electronic music to friends and to people and they're like what what's techno like I don't listen to <laughs> you know so like I can relate to that because I started throwing parties worth 30 people would show up, yeah. but I didn't care because I loved it. Yeah. And I would be out there passing out flyers and like going up to, to groups of people and talking about it. Like mm. I put in that work Yeah, and you know, eventually the events got bigger and bigger until it was like, we would have events with five, 600 people. We actually wound up doing a weekly night mm. that was just dedicated to dance music. Yeah. So, um, I think it's, it's especially when you're, when you're, when it's a new sound or, or, or new genre mm. up and coming, I think that's huge, man. That's very important. Yeah. How do you go about that nowadays? Because I feel like when I first started, came, came up in music and the same, same for you, like the internet wasn't a huge thing to promote anything on it wasn't really yeah. internet based. It was more so, yeah, you handed out fly. I remember standing in Bristol city center, fucking handing out flyers all day long. Um, yeah. And putting posters up and trying to run away from the police and kind of just not get caught doing shit like that. How different is it nowadays to what it was then? Um, I mean, I still think the community, like it starts, it starts with a, well, to answer your question directly, it's very different. Yeah. 
but I still think the community of it, I think now you just have more tools. Mm. So when you have that community, you can expand it faster Mm -hmm. because of the internet. But I, I still think it comes down to like a group of really, a few individuals uh, that are really passionate about something mm-hmm. and they're, they're committed to it. So it's going to start with that. But now with the internet, you can just kind of get it there quicker because yeah. you can, you know, you see it on the internet, like you see it on a social media platform and now you can expose it to more people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think if you, the, the, like the core principles of community are still there yeah, and they're still really important, but now you just have more tools to kind of get there quicker. Do you guys as promoters still like engage with the community or do you find do you see that you're at the point now where you're so, you're so big as promoters where it's kind of like without sounding disrespectful you you kind of not lost the community but the community is so big that you can't keep in touch with them at, on a personal yeah. level to where you were at the beginning yeah i think i think we're definitely you know the community of it it doesn't feel as communal yeah. as it did yeah, yeah. years ago. Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with that. We, I think now it's more like, you know, especially for us, cause we don't have like a specific room mm. in Miami at the moment. Yeah. Um, so it's harder to keep the community. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think it's more about like delivering a really good experience for our fans, which sometimes we can control sometimes we can't like we had some issues during music week at one of our venues like the the ac literally went out they had eight eight ac units Mm. and six of them went out (laughs) so like that's nothing i can control no right i have no control over that and to be fair the venue kind of doesn't either Mm. um so i think that's kind of like what we try to focus on now is picking you know, uh, the right venues, the right artists, making sure that the experience is there because we have that trust from the community that we started, you know, years ago. Yeah. 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 No, I I get that. I get that. Okay. Let's, let's talk about Miami music week, WMCs, whatever you want to call it. Um, what was the first year you started throwing parties there? Man, I think our first year was like 2017. Okay. Yeah. So we, yeah, it was 2017. Um, Can you remember what it was? Yeah, we did an event series at at Soho Studios, and we did uh, we did a party. There were a lot like we think we did Res, we did Marshmallow, um, we did a party with Deadbeats. And I think we did something with Monster Cat mm-hmm. and Cascade played. I think that was our first first event series. Um, pretty big, pretty big lineups. Yeah, yeah, they were. Um, but I had been, you know, attending Music Week for for years, yeah. and obviously knew about all the events, and I'd wanted to get into it. We just at the time we were running Life in Color, which was a monster, and yeah. we just were busy. So for us, we weren't going to like shift our focus from that to something else. Yeah. Um, but I had always been very aware of it and thought like there was some really good opportunities in the market. Mm. Um, so yeah, that was our, that was our first year, 2017. And then how does it evolve to doing six parties to 22 in a week? Cause even six um, parties in a week is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <You> see- <laughs> I don't know, man. It just like, like everything I, we just went with it and it's kind of grown, you know, will we do that many parties next year? I don't think so. I don't know. Probably not. Like we, I I had a hunch that, that not a hunch, but I just felt like, you know, there's going to be a lot of people in town. Mm. Um, everyone been kind of cooped up. So we, we went a little bigger than we, we probably should have. Yeah. Um, and not everything was financially successful either. I was right? going to say that so, surely. Well, we know that my night wasn't necessarily financially successful. Like <laughs> we, we do Wednesday night before party is great lineup. It was a cool party, but awesome. it wasn't packed if you know what I mean. And it was a great party, yeah. but it's still like, I know financially that didn't do well. Yeah. I mean, you got to look at it as the aggregate for the week. Um, 
and also like Wednesdays are tough, man. Yeah. They're, they're always tough. Like yeah. we, any, it doesn't matter. Like I know a few other promoters that did events on Wednesday mm-hmm. as well. And they, it was just, it's just the slowest night of the week. Yeah. yeah. Wednesday is, is tough. Thursday is actually the, the best, the, usually the best night. Mm. Friday's another tough night because it's the first night of ultra. Yeah. Um, and then Saturdays are better and Sundays are pretty good too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you just got to kind of look at it like what happened over, over the week. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. But how yeah. T- like 22 parties, how do you even, first of all, how do you start to plan that? I started way in advance. Obviously a lot of these venues we've been working with for years. So yeah. we have the blueprint mm-hmm. and we have the people. Um, but yeah, look, I, I, like I said, I, I don't know if it was so tough because of a lot of the personal stuff I had going on, mm. um, or if it was just that, but you know, I, I can tell you that for a good five, six months, I worked nonstop. Mm. You know, like I would be up, 6 a.m. squeak out like an hour and a half of work, spend yeah. time with my daughter. I'd leave, come home 5.36, spend time with my daughter. Yeah. After she'd go down to bed, I'd work till midnight. And yeah. I did that for for months. And it was, yeah, it was a, it was a lot of work. Um, but, you know, we had a lot of the blueprint there. So, like, you know, the site plans and the actual infrastructure items that we, we, we needed to order. Like yeah. I knew what they were. Mm. So it's really just communicating that across all the different vendors and, and contractors. Um, yeah. So then you go from planning to actually executing it. Well, not even executing, promoting it, talking about it. Yeah. How's that as an operation? Because you're, you're working in a week where the week is, just littered with pies yeah. upon pies upon pies upon pies. How do you even get through the noise? I think that, that, you know, that where we have an advantage there is like we've been in the market for years, yeah. for 10 years. Like it goes back to the life and color days. Like yeah. we've, you know, we're, we're doing large festivals in the market. So, you know, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of, you know, we know who, what groups of sub promoters to work with and whatnot. I mean, I think we have pretty good brand loyalty. Mm. So people know that if you come to one of our events, it's going to be a good event. And if it's not, we'll at least make it right. Like yeah. in, when COVID hit in 2020, I refunded everybody immediately, yeah. Yeah, like yeah. no questions asked. Um, and I think that went a long way with people, mm. you know, we're not perfect as promoters and things slip, but when we do screw up, we try to, we try to make Fix it right. It. Um, so I think, yeah, the brand loyalty and then, you know, we have a guy on our team, Paul Reed, he's, he handles all the marketing. He's been doing it for a while and Mm. he's good at what he does. Yeah. So, yeah. Are you at the point when you're marketing, are you spending a lot on, on ads or are you doing more word of mouth, more like just, just posting out there and just getting word of mouth out there to save money on ads? Where, 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 what's your kind of like percentage wise? You know, we still spend a lot with ads. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Facebook stock should not be, this should be all right. Um, it's like the new rent and, um, yeah, we, we do a lot with ads. Um, we do a lot of like influencer marketing and, and then look also, like, I think that week, you know, the, the parties that I found to be successful, it came down to like early planning. Mm. So the artists that we engage with early on, we have the lineup done early and we yeah. get it out early and there's engagement with the artists. Those yeah. are the shows that are, that, are, that are the most successful. Yeah. Um, and, and not, and not even just like financially, but just like the rollout of it, yeah, you know, like yeah. there's a few parties and I'm not going to name cause I don't want to do that. But like, they're just really difficult to work with. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to work with them ever again yeah, yeah. because, because of that. And the parties didn't perform well either. Mm. So there's a correlation. So I think if there's any artists or managers listening to this, it's like, if you're going to want to do something to be taken seriously during music week, get, get on it early. Yeah. Um, that that's the difference I've, I've found between successful parties and unsuccessful parties. Mm. 
No, totally. I think also, <clears throat> I think it's, it is a collaborative week. It is yeah. a week that we all know that like, as artists, we don't make money. And as promoters, we don't necessarily make as much money as we would if we were putting that show on individually on a week outside of music week, right? We can do if, yeah. if, if, if we're lucky, but like, unless we're on space where we know everyone's going to be, if you know what I mean, unless you're in certain yeah. places, it's very hard to get people to, to those venues that they don't yeah. necessarily know about, or like, especially outsiders of Miami that don't know Miami, that they just go to the yeah. places where they, they, they see all the time. Um, it's a collaborative effort, even with, with the artists is like, when like, let's say for instance, with our, with our thing, with our party, like, getting the lineup that we had for the budget that we had outside of Miami is something that you would outside of Miami music, you would never have. You would never, you would never have. But I think that's the thing is that as, as a collaborative as promoters and artists, we all know that we have to put, we all want to be there. So let's, let's do a favor for everybody. And it's not just for the promoters, it's for all of us. So we can, all throw amazing parties together and actually spend time with each other because we never spend time with each other. Yeah. It's, Everyone's traveling. Yeah. It's an important time of the year for, for me it is anyway, as much as I have like a love hate relationship with WMCs cause it's, you're just fucked every time afterwards. It's so exhausting. <laughs> but it's like, it's also a special time of, of the industry calendar because we're all together, right? And we can all yeah. come together. And like us, like we 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 met. I think that was the first time we fully met in person. I yeah, believe. it was. Yeah, in the hallway. Um, in the hallway, very randomly. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah, it's it's a it's a very strange time. But I I still want to finish out the point. The so you go from promoting the shows to then okay, it's night of show, and you've got four events in one night. What the fuck do you do? Well, um, <laughs> every I time I ask you a question, anybody that's listening to this and not watching this, every time I ask you this question, a question, I see your like brain going, why the fuck did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a scooter, so it's like right here. <laughs> yeah. I see it. That's how I survived. Um, but no, I, I mean, look, I have a, like a team of people, you know, mm-hmm. we, everyone was at a venue. I have some, some contractors that I work with again, that some of them used to work for me full time yeah. back in the day. So like, I trust these people and I would just hop around from party to party. Yeah. Um, so that way I could spend time like, you know, in the crowd, actually, how does the sound yeah. feel and how was the, the acoustics? Like I did all of that. I'm standing in the corner, like how's the line flowing? Mm. Um, do we need to like put certain people here or there to speed up the line? Yeah. Like how are the restrooms? Like, that's what I do that week. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to spend more time with artists like yourself yeah. and, and managers, but my job that week is to make sure you guys have the best possible stage to, to perform your art. Totally. That's how I look at it. Yeah. Um, and I take that really seriously. So, um, yeah, that that's delegate, trust people and get a scooter. That's how I made it through the week, man. That's Invest how I did in it. those scooters. Those scooters are dangerous. If it weren't for that, I, well, there's no way. I was going from, <laughs> you know, I if I had the, I did that a couple of years ago where I walked between two venues and I'm like, this isn't going to work. So then I had a Vespa and my Vespa broke during Basel. <laughs> and I've been so busy, I didn't get to fix it. And I'm like, I don't need a Vespa. That's actually too much. So I got the scooter. Yeah. Because even the Vespa through the traffic is like crazy. The scooter, dude, I'm like. Mm, well, you can go on the pavement. You can go on the sidewalk, can't you, on the pa- on the scooter? You can't do that on the Vespa. Oh, I'll go on the sidewalk with my Vespa. I don't oh, really. <laughs> but I guess you're in it, Miami. It, you're allowed to do shit like that. Yeah. In Miami, they're in Music League. It's whatever. Yeah. It's whatever. The police don't care. Um, was it a successful Music Week for you? Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Look, we, I think there's a few ways to measure success, obviously financially, but also just, it felt like I had been working on that project for years because of COVID. You know, we had, we had 2019, um, 
you know, I bought the company back mm. and then 2020, obviously COVID hit. Yeah. And, and that was devastating. Mm. And then 2021, we still didn't get to do anything. Yeah. Right. Some people try to do some things. I was like, ah, we're not going to do that. So for me, it was like, I have to get this week done. Yeah. Like, I don't care if I lose, I don't care. Like yeah. we're, we're getting this done. And it was like, almost like I took two years of energy and just put it into that week. Mm. And dude, we, yeah, we went all in, but, um, yeah, I think it was, it was a successful week mm. where will we do it again to that degree? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, but you know, we did it. A lot so. of lessons learned as well. And you can grow yeah. from that in future. Um, I want to talk briefly. I don't want to kind of talk about it too much because I feel like we've spoke about it for the last fucking two years constantly but as a promoter i've spoke to a lot of artists but i haven't really spoke to many promoters about how covid was for you and how you survived through covid as a promoter um how the fuck did you do it <laughs> um like well i guess everything financially as well that's yeah the, that's the yeah. one thing i'm ma- mostly asking because it's like as an artist that we have s- other bits of residual income coming in slightly not much yeah. but like we can put records out and we can make a bit of money from it if they do well yeah like you can't yeah we, look we did financially like i've been fortunate you know yeah. i've had some successes in my life so i've been smart with my money and yeah. i'm diversified in real estate and nice. been, you know investing in stocks for a while mm. um so financially, I, I just lived off my off my savings. Yeah. Um, I didn't. I get. I did get some money from the the what was it the 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 grant? Yeah. yeah. From the government. Yeah. It wasn't a lot because I had just bought the company, yeah. so like I didn't have any a lot of revenue to show. Yeah, yeah. So that sucked because <laughs> I know people that got stupid money. Yeah. Um, you know, but that's look for me. It was like I didn't want even if somebody was going to give me that, like, sure. I would have obviously gladly taken it, of course. but in a way I was like, you know what? That's cool because now I just going to prove myself even more. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's how I survived it financially. My ticketing company was really awesome working with me. Uh, the guys at Tixer, mm. their team, like they were, they've been very flexible with, with, you know, certain like funds. Cause we did get an advance years ago Yeah, and they, well, we're, we worked that out. So I'm really appreciative of them. Mm. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I survived was just off my savings. And then we started doing some stuff later in the year. We actually did in a party. I think our first event was with Gordo. It was his first ever show as Gordo. Cause I have a good relationship with, with their team. Yeah. And we did this two day little pop-up party at 1-800 lucky mm. cause it was outdoors. So that, I think that was like our first show that we had done. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was like a year and a half of really no income, mm. which is, it's which rough. is tough. Yeah. It's rough. man. Yeah. I, I it's really you. rough. How, how is that first show when you come back with, especially with Gordo? Cause he, he does well. Carnage does well generally, especially in Miami. How is that feeling of that first show? Is it, is there a lot of nerves? Is there, what is it? Yeah. I mean, I was really concerned about the more of the, like the government, right? Like the, the, the city, yeah. even now, like, I don't know what, and I'd be curious to know what other promoters in Miami think or feel or how they feel, but there's just been a big kind of attitude shift towards mm events in Miami. Um, I think, you know, like they, they were shutting venues down left and right during COVID yeah. um, under this like noise rule because mm. apparently noise has something to do with COVID. I don't know why or how I uh, never got that one explained to me, but um, that was my biggest stress was like, are they going to come shut us down? Yeah. Obviously they didn't, but you know, we, even during music week, like I had a lot of, <laughs> a lot of issues with the city really? and I have a wonderful relationship with them. Yeah. Um, but, and there's, you know, certain people that, that kind of guided me through it, but yeah, they're there. Even to this day, I still have like before every event and during events, I have this like unsettling feeling like is something going to happen with the city. Yeah. It's super weird. And I never felt that way prior to COVID, 
I call it like post like COVID stress disorder, maybe <laughs> because dude, in 2020, we were, we had, we had like 16 events signed up and we were set to load in Yeah, and we had to cancel it that literally that yeah. weekend. Mm. Like I had trucks on the way and it fucked with me, I think. Yeah, it was, <clears throat> I remember that. And it was like literally the week of Miami of WMCs where it canceled where the world just yeah. like shut down. And I remember, I remember in the, in my kitchen and I just canceled the shows and I still had a mate that was flown in from New York to Miami. He's like, I'm still partying. I'm still going. Yeah. And it's just like, dude, give up, man. <laughs> Everyone's give up. Like get the fuck out. Well, That's the thing. We, we tried to press on, you know, and, and then, and then it finally, when it finally hit me, I just could I just couldn't believe it. Mm. Um, it felt so surreal, yeah. like so weird. Um, felt so helpless. Mm. It was just odd. And it was, I'm sure everybody felt that way, but yeah, yeah. And the crazy part is, is a bunch of stuff still happened that week. Yeah. Um, so it was like, they didn't really stop anything, but again, we, we try to be respectful players in the market. And if the mayor in the city's asking us not to do things like, at that time, given the the situation, you know, we did what we thought was best, yeah. which is, you know, cancel the events. Yeah, so. I think sometimes you have to take a bit of a higher ground, right? And <clears throat> it's very easy to say, oh, just carry on. But I think if someone's, if you're being told by the mayor to stop and then you don't stop and then something happens at your event, it, there's a, there's bigger things to, to worry about. And I think sometimes... Yeah. I, I say it a lot. It's just, it's just house music and there's other things that are much bigger and much more, uh, magnitude of just throwing an event, right. Or DJing yeah. at a party. And there comes a point where it's like, it's life. Like we, we, we can overcome yeah. this and we can, we can do this again and we, it's going to happen again. Um, yeah. what I've seen over the years <laughs> is Art Basel kind of taking over almost some of the reins from what WMCs used to be. Um, and my my personal opinion is that Basel Week is probably going to turn into just as big of a week as as WMCs. What's your thoughts on that? I would agree. Um, I, I don't know if they're... I mean, they're too... They're... they're in terms of just the number of people. Mm. Yeah. There's a lot. I mean, I've watched Basil kind of, you know, yeah. grow to like everybody walking around in Wynwood and yeah. it's spread out now all over the city. I think Basil, what I, from, at least from our perspective, it's a little bit more of a curated experience. Like there's a ton of yeah. private parties at smaller venues and it's a bit more exclusive and yeah. it's not, it's not about the music it's about like the whole culture of just yeah. what's happening in fashion and in art and music plays a part of that, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I, I still think music week when it comes to just like pure dance fans, like they're there for that. They're there totally. to rage and party and have a great time. Um, I think Basil is, is a mix of that, but I don't think you're wrong. It's um, it's become like, you know, a very important week for, for music as well. And there's some really great events. Well, it's really interesting during COVID what happened with the whole NFT boom and the whole crypto boom, which I think a lot of artists really jumped on because yeah. it was the one, the only way to, for people to make money during a certain time. And <clears throat> I think that then correlated to Basel, which is all about art and the yeah, culture yeah. which then brought even more music to that week because you had a load of artists going into or a load of producers and djs going into the nft atmosphere which then brings it back together to basil and i think yeah. that's only going to grow really interesting are you involved in any of that stuff like nfts and crypto I, i'm i'm into it but i i'm not like publicly into it if that yeah. makes sense where i'm like trying yeah. to i have this like very weird i i want to test things a lot before i ask my fans to buy something from me yeah. um and i want to give something of value to my fans 
rather than just like a money grab thing. Yeah. And I feel Got like it. a lot of the NFT space has been purely a money grab. Um, yeah. And what they've actually given, what people have actually bought from them, what they're told of what they're buying to what they're actually buying isn't what they're actually getting. And I feel yeah. like if I was to start an NFT, it would have to be something of value for fans for the rest of their lives or for the rest mm -hmm. of the time that they're fans of, of me. Yeah. Um, and I think at this moment in time, I don't think we're there yet with NFTs. I think it, we will be there. And I think it will yeah. go there eventually. Um, and I have some concepts that I think would work. And even for promoters, if, for like yourself, I feel like there's ways NFTs can work really well. I just don't think it's there yet. Got it. What about you? You know, I I, I respect that about you. Well, I, I, I was going to give you a shout out about that. Like, I feel like the things you do are super genuine. You know, like even... I, I remember when we did the show with you in what was that in 2019 or yeah, 2019, like you played open to close, like you're doing things that are different. They, they feel genuine, even the podcast. Um, so I, I respect that, 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 that's how you feel about it. It's a good, it's a good approach to have. And I think in the long run, you're going to win tenfold because of that. Thanks man. No, I think for me is like, I try to, my view is what do I want as a consumer? And if I look at like some artists who I look up to, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what do I want from them if I was to be part of their fan base? And mm -hmm. that's the only way. And there's there's people that I have followed and then are like, why the fuck did they do that? Like that's that's yeah, purely yeah. like based on monetary value where you've just gone and made a shit ton of money and fucked everyone else off. Yeah. And for me that you, it's very, I'm pretty sure you've, you've come across this in, in your career plenty of times where you can put a show on and you can make a fuck ton of money, but they're just something, something doesn't feel a hundred percent afterwards. And whether that's because it just, wasn't authentic to you and to, mm -hmm. to your who you are as a person like there's things like i've done remixes for money and every time it comes out i'm like why the fuck did i do that and it's just not authentic and it's very nice yeah. like i don't and i'm i'm all for making money i'm all for that but i feel like a longevity thing is yeah. like, i'd rather i'd rather earn less money to start with and grow something authentic so that in 10 years time it's making a shit ton of money and i have a shit ton of people around me that really give a fuck yeah i call that the long game versus the short game yeah and i think it's really important um if you're gonna be if you're in this for the long term like you have to think that way yeah. you can't think of these short money grabs um and, and i and i say that like we have a small team but we talk about that now. Like yeah. there's certain venues that we dropped after one or two shows. Like yeah. this is not the right venue yeah. for us. We made money, but the experience was terrible. Yeah. Um, or it was like a difficult process, even with artists, like yeah. there's artists that I'm not going to name names, but we've, we've made great money with it over the years, but it was just like pulling teeth. Yeah. So we, we dropped it. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's, and you got to think like you have, I think it's important to think that way. And I, and I, I recognize that early on with the limited interactions I've had with you that you think that way. And I think that's, that's awesome. Thanks man. Yeah. I think, I think that's the thing is I don't know about you, but well, I, I pretty sure I know about you and from how long we've spoken about, but like you do it because you love it. Right. If you wanted to just yeah. go and make a shit ton of money, you're intelligent enough to go and do that. And yeah, thanks. <laughs> like you can, if you know what I mean. And and it's it's clear that you have done that because you've gone invested in in other things and, and you're yeah. you're you're smart with, with your finances. But sometimes 
when you're just doing it just to make money, you're happy just to make money and it doesn't matter. But I feel like that, that doesn't, it doesn't last long and, and we can all see through it. We can yeah. all see through it. There's, there's always the artists that jump from fashion to fashion to just make money and look at EDM. Look how yeah. quick, look how quickly that came up, and there was a shit ton of artists that came went to the top and were making millions of dollars, and then to the point where they're not. They won't sell tickets. Yeah, I, I had I had Luke on, laid back Luke on, the podcast, and it was a really like really interesting podcast. And he, I want to listen to that one. It's really good, and and he spoke about like the ups and downs, and he spoke about how he went from earning a shit ton of money to nothing pretty much yeah and and no one giving a fuck because it's kind of you're not saying he was but because it's it's just fashion yeah yeah it, it's you know that's a it, it's happening right now like yeah. w- with the, the sound i mean yeah. i watched it we we came up with the edm boom and now you know right right before covid i started seeing it yeah um the sound shifting it went more to like house music yeah. which i was i'm obviously happy about yeah. um because i personally enjoy that music more but now like that's the sound like that's where the wave is if you're yeah. producing and, and that's why i'm so happy to see guys like like chris lake killing it now because yeah. you know i know his somewhat of his his background right but that's it that's the sound now and it's tied in with the fashion and how people are dressing and how they're yeah their whole image and 100 percent hundred percent. Yeah. It's amazing, man. Um, what have you got planned for the rest of the year? Anything interesting or are you just sticking with what you're doing? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got, we got, we got a pretty nice calendar booked out for the rest of the year. Um, a couple of dates we're looking to like fill in and mm. stuff like that. Um, I bought a, so in, during COVID, I bought a, a piece of property in Jacksonville, Florida, right on the, on the river there. Nice. Um, and we're developing a venue there. So Amazing. it's going to be a, should be, I'm hoping like 1200 cap ish, yeah. maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Um, so we're developing that. Um, That's big for Jacksonville. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really excited about it because, you know, when I was going to school there, I always said like, I want to own a venue. I want to own a venue in Jacksonville one day. Yeah. And if the opportunity's there, hopefully I'll be able to do it. Mm. And, um, my business partner, Evan, who I've been friends with since college, Mm. um, he called me and he's like, Hey, I think I've got the spot. So, um, and it's great because we actually got, um, you know, we landmarked the building. So it's going to be there forever, um, which is really cool. And I'm, my hope is that it's going to be, you know, the spot, the hard ticket live room in that city forever. Like I wanted to live, that's well, awesome. well past my lifetime. Um, and I think we're building it that way. We'll see. Um, so I've been working on that a lot and that's going to be a huge focus of mine in the next, yeah. you know, next year. Um, and we're trying, I'm trying to find a room here in Miami. I've got mm. a couple good things going there. Cause I think this city needs more concert venues. I agree. Um, and then, yeah, we're doing some stuff in Nashville as well. Nice. Um, which we, you know, we had you there, um, at the rooftop and yeah, yeah that, that's a venue we don't work with anymore. Um, <laughs> that shit, pie, the honestly, I they're listening to this podcast, but that pie, yeah, it, was, it was, it was, I had fun. It was, uh, yeah. we, we have these parties in our careers, right. And you have it, I'm sure as well. And you just have to suck it up and just take one for the team. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I wanted to take, I actually wanted to go. So you met my brother-in-law. Yeah. Simon. The yeah. Chef. Yeah. I don't remember how you met him, but he's a, he's the head chef at a, one of the best steakhouse in for sure in the city. And it's one of the best in the country. So we got to do Nashville over again. Mate, like, I'd love to. There. I love Nashville a lot. Nashville is yeah. one of my favorite cities in America. I love it. I'd love to. Well, it's it's getting there, and there's it, that market's getting better and better. But yeah, I needed we need to do that one over. 
I, re- um, I respect I, you. Yeah, I, I respect you for trying to do Nashville and and for and for being persistent because Nashville is not an electronic music city at all. It's yeah. you know the roots of of country music there. Yeah, and I respect it so much. Like just trying because when you when you hit, you're gonna hit hard. It will hit yeah. fucking hard. It's it's. So we did a couple more shows after yeah. you. And I think that's when we realized like the venue is some of the equation here. Yeah. But the, I mean, the last few shows we've done have been, we brought Aoki there. We brought Shaq. Um, we have a show upcoming with Mala. Um, so like all the shows we've, we've, we've done um, since like in the last call it six to eight months have done well i think yeah. i just realized like what we need to do in that market and how we need to educate people and also and shack it, and marla are so much bigger than me <laughs> no, no, but it's, i'm saying like we gotta kind of like we gotta go a little commercial yeah and educate and get people yeah. excited and build that community so yeah. that's a, in that market we're focusing heavily on the community there yeah like this we have a about, team yeah. of, of ambassadors and people that you know, we can share music with and they share with their friends. There's some cool so, kids in Nashville as well. Some really cool. That again? There's some really cool kids in Nashville. Yeah. Well, dude, I'm going to, we got to redo that. We're going to redo <laughs> Nashville and we'll go to see Simon and he'll hook us up. We'll have a great meal Yeah, I'd love and to. we'll, we'll do it over. I'd love to, man. Do you spend much time in Nashville? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm there when I go, I'll go for a few days. Um, I was actually supposed to go, um, this past, what was it? Memorial day weekend. Mm. But my wife got sick. Actually, we canceled the flight that morning. She woke up. Yeah. She, I'm not feeling well. And she wound up testing positive for COVID. Uh, okay. So we, yeah, so I didn't go, but I'm going to be back. I'll be up there later this month. And eventually I want to get like a place there. Yeah. Um, like do something with real estate and solid place little... to invest right now. Yeah. Solid place. My business manager the- just bought a, bought a bit bought a, or they've just moved in like an office over there as well because like that it's crazy over there at the moment right is your business manager ryan or is ryan just your manager no ryan's just my manager do you know jen jen i, think so. de, I can't i can never remember her last name sorry jen that's all good i i i, I mean i don't know a whole lot of the back end so like you guys have like managers business managers label managers it's like yeah so yeah my whole team so i have agents two agents an agent in europe an agent in america um ryan who's my direct manager jen who's my business manager um got it and we have my label team as well that run my, run my label cool so big crew what are you what are you most excited about on, on your end um doing more territories this year i'm trying to like build out of america and because it's weird for me i started i'm obviously british and grew yeah. up in england and then signing to dirty bird main meant that i kind of toured america more than anywhere else yeah. um and as you know like dirty bird is a very american brand now yeah um and it's when I had Carnage on the podcast, actually, he spoke about it and he spoke about yeah, how, I remember that. how he, it was very, you kind of need to get out of America to, you have to leave America to then get bigger in America, but also get bigger in the rest of the world. What, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> when I took Ryan on as a manager, 2019, um, it, w- it was our goal to kind of tour more of the rest of the world. So that's the goal for me is just to like do more, Europe, do more South America, do more Asia and kind of really grow out of America a little bit. Um, nice. That's the goal for me. And write a fuck ton of good music. That's, yeah, that's it. That's, that's the plan. Um, and keep this podcast yeah. going. The podcast is growing, which is nice to see. Um, but yeah, it's, it takes up a lot of time as well. So I'm, I want to, by the end of this year, I want to streamline everything. So, I can concentrate on writing music more so than everything else, but I can still mm. do everything else. So I can still have the com- these podcast conversations and have somebody to edit them and, and go and do everything themselves. Cause at the moment I'm doing everything myself. 
So uh, it's, it's still a lot, but it takes time to get to that level. So yeah. It's Very good. cool. It's good, man. Um, Eric, thanks so much for coming on, man. It's been been great thanks, to catch Paul. up and let's catch. Are you around this weekend? Um, I'm actually not, I'm going to be in Orlando. Um, my mother just moved there actually last week. So I need to go up and help her with some stuff. Cool, but, man. Um, well, I'm sure we'll catch yeah. up at some point. I've got yeah, your number I now. Like that. Um, so let's go for dinner and let's catch up. Yeah. I want to send you something too. So please um, do. text me your address for your, your studio or wherever you're at right cool. now. Appreciate it, man. Um, keep right, safe. Well, uh, and see you soon. You got it, man. Take care. Okay, man. See you soon. Bye. Bye. And that is a wrap. Uh, big love to Eric for coming on. I really enjoyed that conversation. Felt like it could have gone on for a long time. But um, thank you for listening. Keep safe. Don't forget to subscribe. Share it. Till next time.